Jesus. You know, Miriam, uh, I had a word for you the other day when we were on prayer, when I kept getting cut off or whatever happened, I don't remember. It was a mess. And the Lord said to me that day, have you made your choice? Well, you already made your choice now, so it's kind of past because that was a couple weeks ago. Okay? And he said to me to tell you that in making that choice, you're going to find uh, that in this place, you can have uh, what you've been looking for, that the part that you are to be in this body, God has designed for you to be able to fit it and to be that expression and to let that go and to add and enhance what's already here. And he said that for you also, a caution for you, to be aware that there are things that will change because you're not where you're going to be, but you're on your way. And there's more changes coming in your life that God is getting ready to reveal to you. And they are going to be awesome. You're going to be so excited and embracing them and just growing in the Lord and becoming part of what he's doing in this end time hour. Amen. Hallelujah. See you, Jerry. Okay. Amen. Blessings on Jerry. Let's just pray, God, your blessing upon her life, Father. God, you have destined her days, Lord. Father, and you have decided everything, Father, regarding her already and in advance. Father, we pray for her, God, for her heart, her soul, her body, her mind, Father. God, strength to her. May she fulfill all that you have called her to do, Father, even in this latter days of her life. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, as some of you know, I do travel to Nigeria. And I haven't gone since uh, just before the pandemic started in 2019. And I'm trying to go back this year. But I'm asking you to pray for them. Last time I was here, I, I challenged you all to pray for revival in the church. But I want you also to pray for Nigeria. It's uh, really near and dear to my heart. I have many ministers that I'm connected with there I'm part of an organization called Rejoice International out of Mississippi, and uh, we have uh, at least 400 ministers and churches in Nigeria that are connected to us. So when I go there, I minister to all of those pastors. Uh, they all come from across the nation to be able to go and to uh, take, you know, they receive from us, and then they can go and take it into their congregations. And I just, I, I saw in the spirit several years ago when I was there, just that God, I saw a map of Nigeria and the fire was starting to burn on that map in the south and it began to spread all across the nation. And I believe that God has something mighty for the nation of Nigeria, but there is a very strong Islamic spirit influence in the nation that has been spreading and growing and the government is uh, not doing anything about it. It's dangerous when I go. I'm like a sore thumb. There's very few, any white people in the whole nation. So when I go, I really stand out. And they think that uh, uh, they want to make me a target. So I have to have safety when I'm there. I have guards with AK-47s that are there. Not ARs, actually AKs. And um, they protect me. But uh, pray about that. That would be November if I go again this year. Uh, but I really believe they need to see us. And it might even just be me by myself. But those churches haven't heard from us in a couple of years. And they're, they're, you know, it's like the Macedonian call, you know, in the spirit. I'm hearing them calling. They want us to come. And we need to, um, we, we, we're just wanting to know the will of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You know, Mary, I just been hearing this word of transition and new face for you, which is so obvious, taking place. But I know that God is in the midst of this as you have been um, just, I just see you as just like a flower unfolding. You know how that is. You know, you can watch a little time lapse thing and you can watch it. And I just feel that you're unfolding further. You're not anywhere near the bud stage. I mean, you're, you're already a flower, you know, but it's just opening even more, you know, as the sun 
the light, the glory of God is continuing to pour over into your life. And in this new phase and transition, I just sense that you're going to even, there's even, um, I know in this hour that there is an open uh, heaven and a fresh revelation for every believer. Uh, so that's for all y'all, as we say down in Tennessee. <laughs> there's a fresh revelation pouring out to the remnant right now in this hour. See, because things have been shut up in the heavens, the scripture says, until the time. And that is that we are coming into the time even faster than probably most of us of our age have even imagined. But there's so much more that the Lord has for you, and you are on his path. The steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. And as you are walking in those steps, I'm telling you, get ready, because what you think you know, there's so much more that you're going to know, and, and it's, it is going to be a joy to you because you're going to eat the word, and it is going to be the joy and rejoicing of your heart. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Spirit of God, we love you. We thank you for being with us. <sighs> Hallelujah. My question to you today is, why do you come to church? <laughs> no one wants to volunteer that one. You know, in Tennessee, they have a word that they use. Maybe use it up here. I didn't hear it until I moved down there. Super nice. Oh, she's super nice. He's super nice. You know, oh, you're super nice. <laughs> I'm doing that just for, you, just for you guys. I purpose myself not to say y'all because it doesn't sound right anyway. You know, it's like, it's like me trying to speak Spanish. You know, it just doesn't, you know, they know in an instant I'm not Hispanic as much as my mother-in-law thought I was. That's another story. Um, but uh, they say super nice, you know. And so my question is, did Jesus die to just make us super nice people? Be a bunch of super nice people that gather together with other super nice people. Or all just have super nice families. Everything's just super nice. I don't think so. Did he die for us to come on Sunday and gather with them super nice people? then go home and live our life, maybe bring our tithe when we gathered with those super nice people. Is that what he died for? Maybe we enter into worship a little bit with those people. I think it's a little more than that. And so there is a purpose to the gathering when we come together. The real uh, original pattern, design of the church we see in the book of Acts. And uh, for the most part, the majority of the church doesn't see it and doesn't live it. I say all the time, you've heard me say it before, as much as we in the non-denominational independent churches think we're free, we're as religious as most of the rest that are denominationalized and liturgical and whatever it might be. So many churches I go, I've visited over the years that have the spirit-filled name, you would never know that anybody spoke in tongues or they still believed in Azusa Street Revival or anything. You don't see any gifts of the spirit moving. Everybody follows the same pattern. I could think I was in a Baptist church or a Methodist church or, you know, or just a regular Bible church or an evangelical church or... I wouldn't know the difference unless I read their tenets and they told me that they did. I would have never known. And we have to realize that there is more to us as being Christians than uh, just attending service or being good or, you know, doing our best to follow the Ten Commandments or whatever it might be that we think Christianity is about. A list of do's and don'ts and, you know, I'm doing my best to follow them. Because it's a living relationship with the one who came and died for us on the cross and rose again on the third day. And when we have a living relationship with him every day, then something changes when we come together. You know, we can come as most do, the majority do, Come to church for the purpose of being a spectator, a consumer, 
a taker who don't come for the purpose of participating, producing, and giving. And that is the difference between what I would say is a real Christian who has a vibrant relationship with the Holy Spirit and those that are just religious. We should come expecting that we have a part. And I am putting a demand on you in the Spirit today that every time you come into this place, that you come expecting to participate, that you, you eliminate this mentality of that I'm coming to receive, I'm coming to be blessed, I'm coming to get something. That's the side product of you coming alive and ready to participate. There is, how do you get in the kingdom of God? You have to give to get. When our life is one of which when we gather together, it is solely for me to get, you will get nothing of what you're supposed to get. Just like Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, it seems like that's contradictory because I see people accomplishing stuff all over the world that don't have Jesus. But they can do nothing of what they should be able to do with the anointing of God, with the infilling of the Spirit, with the unction of the Spirit of God, animating the very gifts that God has placed in them for the purpose and destiny that He begot them into the earth in the first place. You know, for every single one of you, in six days God created in the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day He rested. The word rest means to cease from your labors. He ceased from His labors. Because he'd already done everything. When you were born, God didn't say, oh my gosh, Scott has come into the earth. I must now speak forth his destiny. What am I going to do with this guy? I have to think about it. No, on the sixth day, he created man. Every single one of you, from before you were ever born, God spoke your name. God knew who your parents would be. God knew where you would live. He knew you, what education you'd get. He knew your socioeconomic status. He knew if your parents would be good or bad. He knew if you were going to be poor or rich. He knew everything about you. He spoke it into existence from the beginning. He knew every choice of every generation of the trandles that would ever exist. And until the time that I came into the earth, he knew where I would be. He knew I would be the, the son of David Victor and Helen Phyllis Trandall. He knew I'd be of Polish and German descent. He knew everything about me. He knew that he had a call on my life. He knew that he had a specific anointing and gifts that he wanted to release through me. I'm saying me, but it's you, too. We have to stop that divide that, that the religious spirit tries to bring into the church of God. Each and every one of you is as much anointed as I am, as much a minister as I am, has as much of Jesus and Holy Spirit as I have. You, we are all the same. We all have, are the same new creation. Every single one of us, you know, I've been dwelling this whole idea. I'll share it with you. This, uh, as I've been reading the Passion Translation, I've been reading the, um, the Psalms, and it, he, he, he translates it as, to the pure and shining one, so many times at the beginning of the Psalm, to the pure and shining one. And I began to think about God, as the Scripture tells us in Revelation, that, that there's no need for the sun because the whole place is lit up with the very essence of his being. He is an incomprehensible being of light. Not just an incomprehensible being of light, but we know from the scripture that he is love, that he is truth, that he is 
life, that he is holy, that he is a consuming fire, and that this is what is exuding from his being that lights up all of heaven. And now I take that from one next step to what we know of the truth of the scripture, that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Everything that he was is gone, and everything that he is is what? Of, the scripture says, God. The incomprehensible being of light dwelling inside of us. Is that insane to think about? What is my potential? What is it when we come together, brethren, that we are each filled with this incomprehensible being? And how does he want to manifest himself through us to one another? It's mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. He is so gracious. We don't deserve it. But it's what he desired. It's what he wanted. To be inside of us. To be one with us. He didn't want us to be in the garden. He knew man would fall. If it was me or you, we all would have done the same thing. Every single one of us. He knew from the beginning Jesus Christ was the lamb slain, as the scripture teaches us, from the foundation of the world. The plan was in place from the beginning. It was no surprise to God. When he was saying, Adam, where are you? It was no surprise. Hallelujah. And so what I say is this, that the reason that Jesus died is for that. And that we would surrender all of who and what we are. That he might be able to become all of who he wants to be in us. You know, whenever I pray for someone for salvation, that's the last thing I say in the prayer. Lord Jesus, make me into who you want me to be. And that would be a good prayer every day for every one of us. Make me more today, Lord, into who you want me to be than I was yesterday. See, it's already there. It's all inside you. But it's this soul, this mind, this will, this emotions that hinders the manifestation of what's inside of us. Jesus stood upon the Mount of Transfiguration and he opened up what was inside of him. He let them see the incomprehensible being of light that was inside of him. And I believe if the scripture tells me that God is preparing a bride for Jesus that is spotless and blameless, right, without wrinkle or any such thing. I mean, that's not the church of today. It's not been the church of any generation. But now, in this time, God's glory is pouring out on the earth. And God's spirit is once again pouring out to fill his people afresh. And I believe that there will be a transfiguration moment of the last day's church that will shine in the glory of God. Every believer manifesting the kingdom of God as an ambassador and citizen of heaven. This is not our place. We are already heaven's citizens. That's us. That's you. That's me. Say that. I am a citizen of heaven. I'm a spirit being that is a new creation, that is filled, connected, one with an incomprehensible being of light. God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That's me. That's you. So what is it when we get together? The Spirit of God is brooding. He wants to be moving. But 
He cannot move if what we do is the same old thing all the time. Or we're too fearful to step out. You know, we, we once again must, you know, in the, I got raised in a Word of Faith church. If you know what a Word of Faith church is, that's Kenneth E. Hagen. I love the man. He was awesome, man, when he was here. And he was a prophet. He was an apostle. He was an apostle. But an apostle is a, is a prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. He can flow in all five. He was amazing. And one of the things that we taught all the time was that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He who knew no sin, God poured into him our sin. I like to say that in exchange, God might pour into us all of his goodness and righteousness. Jesus took your sin and my sin and he nailed it to the cross and he poured into us the very righteousness of God. We must get past those things that try to say to us that we are inferior, that we are not what the scripture says we are, that we've failed, that we've sinned, that we've erred, that we've missed it, that we've hurt someone, that we've been hurt. There isn't a person in here who could raise their hand and tell me they haven't been hurt. And we let these things hinder us when we come together. We let these things hinder us when we're out in public. The church is quiet as a mouse. You don't hear us speak. We're afraid. We're timid. But the Bible says that the righteous are bold as a lion. What does a lion do? Roars! I am king of the jungle. Who dares? Cross my path. Every place on which my paws tread, he says, is given to me. This is my territory. I reign supreme here. The righteous are bold as a lion. I'm telling you it is time for the army of God to arise once again in the authority that God has given us. You know, I, had a, I live in Dresden, Tennessee, December 10th. 2021, a tornado came through my town. It was heading straight for my house, maybe off to the side just a little bit. We were watching the news, and they said, Dresden, Tennessee, you have 15 minutes. You better take cover. You know, in the south, they don't make basements. We didn't have a shelter. We got in our tubs, as they tell you to do, and grabbed some mattresses off the beds and put them over us. And we were praying in the Holy Ghost and were commanding that thing to move in the name of Jesus. A quarter mile from our house, it hit a restaurant, and it turned, and it moved. And I'm sad for all the destruction that happened in my city. But that thing moved, and I believed it moved because of the authority of the name of Jesus, that it could not come towards my property. Some of you may have seen on Facebook, it was a board that flew into my property from I don't know where, and I nailed it up on a tree so that it goes like this on the tree, right where it fell in my property over my house. It blew over my house. I had some dead trees come down from probably a spiraling wind off to the side of it, but the Lord protected us. And I'm telling you, it is time once again for the church of God to walk in the authority that we have been given. Now, I don't know if the, anybody else was commanding that thing to move and their house was destroyed. I don't know, but I know in my experience that our house was spared. Jesus spoke to the storm, did he not? We have the same authority. Listen, I'm telling you that there are people, I said this before, who are going to stand in that day, that judgment day, we're going to see these people, most of whom none of us will know who they are. 
But the truth of it will be that they ruled in this world and they reigned as kings in prayer because they took authority and nobody knew that they were changing history. That can be you or me if we want that to be. Or we can cower with the rest. We have to get past that place and recognize once again we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You know the, uh, I don't know what time I started. Uh, uh, Apostle Danny Walker, home church that we're from, he now just moved to Georgia. (laughs) I love him. And he said in this hour, what God wants to do once again is pierce our hearts with the revelation of righteousness. Because when we have that, there is nothing that can stop us. When we know we are right with God, when we know that God's righteousness has been deposited within us, we will walk in a level that we've not walked in before. And it's time, people. It's time to arise. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down and look it up to Google it. It's a prophecy from 1963. From an evangelist, his name is Tommy Hicks, H-I-C-K-S. Look it up. Read it. I've read it many times. I've posted it many times. I believe it's coming to pass. He had it three nights in a row, 1963, Tommy Hicks, End Time Prophecy. And it's of the arising of the sleeping giant, which is the church. Arising, shaking off the debris standing as a mighty giant in the earth, being poured out upon by the Holy Spirit, separating like cells of a being all over the face of the earth, on fire with the glory of God, bringing a manifestation of God's glory and His kingdom to a lost and desperate and hopeless and hungry world and a great, massive, the most ever we've seen, harvest of souls in the world is going to happen in that hour. And could that hour be today? Because I tell you, there will be many who will be on the outside looking in, and it will be too late. Because there's only a specified time that God knows of when we can purchase the oil to be lamps that are burning bright in the hour that God wants to use us. I'm just speaking. Is that all right? And the, you know, Jesus, when he came in in his triumphal entry, I don't think I've shared this here before. Uh, You can read it, Matthew 21. Jesus came in. And he fulfilled several things in that moment. He came into Jerusalem, which was the place of the high priest, which he was. He came in, and they said, who is he? They said, he is Jesus, the prophet. And he was the prophet. He was a prophetic minister of God. That was how they could align with him. You know, when Jesus said, He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet, he had to say it that way. He couldn't have said, he that receives an apostle or an evangelist, an apostle or evangelist, nobody knew what he was talking about. He had to align it with what Israel could understand. I mean, the truth of that passage is, he that receives a fivefold office minister in the name of what they're called to do can then receive from them the fullness of the office and the anointing that is upon them and be changed in the moment that they're ministering. But Jesus came, and they said he was a prophet. He established himself as the high priest of Jerusalem. And he came in there, and the children said what? Hosanna to the king. He was king, he was priest, and he was a prophetic minister. And so are every one of you. We must stop. I was started saying before, the division of clergy and laity. You are a minister of God. You are a king in the earth. You are a priest unto God. 
every single one of us. And we must embrace it. You know, that is the thing I will tell you. For any five-fold office minister, you know, when it was actually the Nigerians that started telling me I was a prophet. You know, I tried to fit the mold of pastor and teacher. But when that's not you, guess what? You fail. And I failed and was so disappointed. Thought I had failed God. <laughs> Even in those days. I had a prophetic anointing and had no idea what I was. But when you find out who you are, you, me, find out who you are, you must embrace it. If you don't embrace it, you will never be it. Until you begin to see, I am a king in this earth, the scripture says I am. I am a priest in this earth, the scripture says I am. I am a minister in the earth. The scripture says I am. And I am a prophetic person. The scripture says I am. Every single one of us are prophetic ministers, priests. Yes. Can't say it enough. Embrace it. Receive it. Embrace it. Walk it. Be it. And so when we get together, it should just be this conglomeration of Kings and priests and ministers, you know, just exuding the light that is within them, having been inspired by Holy Spirit prior to their arrival, to be able to release what God has. Amen. You know, uh, uh, I'll continue in this triumphal entry before I get to that, because it's important. Afterwards, Jesus did two acts, the scripture says, I think in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those two things were he went into the temple and he cleansed it, and he encountered a fig tree that had no fruit. When he went into the temple and cleansed it, Jesus, I believe, and I've done this here before, where he sat in the synagogue, I believe that the righteous anger in him began to stir. He didn't come in. I'm going to start kicking tables over and whipping people. You know, I believe he came in and he was sitting there and started to stir that, that zeal for God's house, that need for prayer in the house of God. And he saw the merchandising and how it had become a place of business where the spirit of God no longer resided and Ichabod had been written over it. And it stirred his spirit and he began to pick up three pieces of something board, leather, I don't know, and he began to braid them, and it stirred in him until it got to the point where he looked down and he had this cord, and he began to kick over the tables and whip the, the merchants and kick them out and yell. The scripture says, my house shall be a house of prayer. And most churches today in this hour are not a house of prayer Prayer is relegated maybe to another day, mostly not even existent. I question even many ministers I meet if they even have much of a prayer life, especially those filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, my gosh, he tells us, brethren, I, I, I pray in tongues more than y'all. <laughs> Says y'all. Y'all, says you all, but if you're in the South, it's y'all. You know that. Why? Thingy, all. He says, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Doing what? Praying in the Holy Ghost. How many churches I go, I don't even hear the minister praying the Holy Ghost. I do it. You guys know almost every time I come in. Because I know Holy Spirit is real. I know every believer should have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I know that there is an empowering by the Holy Spirit that you can't have if you don't have it. You are missing part of the kingdom. The church was not in existence until the Spirit of God fell on Pentecost. Nobody got saved. Nobody got healed. 
Nobody got delivered. Nobody was redeemed. Read it. Nobody. The Spirit of God fell. They all spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. A mighty sound came into the room. The Scripture literally speaks of a tornadic sound. It was not a wind. Their hair wasn't, you know. It was a sound. It was the sound of the Spirit of God colliding with the earth and bringing forth a birthing of what God wanted to do in the earth, something that we've never seen before. And we've relegated it to, oh, well, that was for that era. And even us who are filled with the Spirit of God and know what I'm talking about, how much are we praying in the Holy Spirit? You want to hear him, you must pray in the Holy Spirit. You want to be bold, you need to pray in the Holy Spirit. You want to know your kingly and priestly anointing and the ministry that God has called you to, pray in the Holy Spirit. Building yourselves up, encouraging yourself, energizing is the word in the Greek, energizing your spirit, man, praying in the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, I didn't have this in my notes, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2, that when we pray in the Spirit, we pray mysteries to God. But let me tell you, he says, he that prays in an unknown tongue shall also pray that he may interpret it. Well, I guess he says that when they speak in a tongue. But I tell you, the same is true for when you're praying. When you pray in a tongue, ask God, what am I praying about? When you do it long enough, let me tell you, you don't need to ask him anymore because revelation begins to just flood your soul from your spirit, man, and you begin to know things that you never knew before. How many of you have went and witnessed to a person? I remember when this first happened to me when I first got saved. It was just astonishing. And I began to witness to somebody, and I thought I knew nothing but as the Spirit of God breathed upon me, he began to inspire me with words and thoughts and scriptures that I didn't even know or couldn't have thought of and began to share them like I had been in the Lord many years. And I was astonished. I felt like it was another person. What will happen to me? How did that happen? And we must get back to that. I'm telling you, praying in the Holy Ghost empowers you. It's going to give you a zeal uh, for God. It's, it's going to position you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Let us pray for a moment. I just want us to pray just to eliminate some baggage. Father, we just come to you in the mighty name of Jesus right now, Father, for that very purpose of eliminating, God, you're speaking to us. We hear you, Holy Spirit. We know that you're saying things specifically to each of us. Lord, we repent even right now for allowing those things to hinder us from speaking your truth, from being a minister of the gospel. Lord, forgive us for allowing demonic forces to bind us when we could be free because he that is free in Christ is free indeed and we are free indeed. Let us walk in the freedom that you've given us. May your boldness pour out upon us, Lord. Forgive us for believing we were inferior. Forgive us for believing that we were shy. Forgive us for timidity and fear. Forgive us for that lack of courage, O oh God. Forgive us, Lord, for taking hurt and allowing it to keep us from where we need to be. Forgive us, God, for bitterness and anger and hatred. Father, we repent of it now, Father. We release those, even in this moment, who have hurt us. Father, we let them go. Father, we pray your blessing upon them. May you draw them closer to you, God, that they may have a walk with you greater than we have. Father, we believe you now, Lord God, that you're moving in our midst and you're changing us, oh, Father. Oh, we desire to be more like you, Jesus. Spirit of God, we depend on you in this moment. Breathe upon us and change us. We thank you for it now. In Jesus' mighty name, O oh being of incomprehensible light, Father, almighty God, oh, that you who live within us, may you shine forth in all your glory through our lives.
that we would see our potential and fulfill it to the fullest, completing the destiny that you put upon our lives today. In Jesus' mighty name, show us, Lord, prophetically what you want us to be, what you want us to do. Show us where we're going. Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet, and it's a prophetic light, Lord, unto our path, revealing where we're going. We thank you for it now, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So what then, brethren, is the right course, it says in the Amplified in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then, brethren, is the right course when you meet together? Each one has a hymn, a teaching, a disclosure of special knowledge or information, an utterance in a tongue or interpretation of it. But let everything be constructive and edifying and for the good of all. He didn't say don't do it. He said let it be in order. Let it be functional for the good of all. May the Spirit of God breathe upon those who have a hymn, those who have a revelation, who received a dream, had a vision, have a teaching, have a tongue or an interpretation of it. Have a prophetic word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And he goes on to say, you know, if a couple, two or three are are have a tongue, let them bring forth their tongue and have one interpret. If let the prophets prophesy two or three. How many did they have? More than two or three. Because he says, let the prophets prophesy. Two or three, he didn't say let those who have a gift of prophecy prophesy. He said let the prophets prophesy. Two or three, and let the others discern. And if another one has one that is sitting there, have the others hold their tongue and let him bring forth his word because the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. Right? And so this place then becomes a place of an open heaven where all of us have been out in, the, in our lives and in the world in a relationship with Jesus by the agency of Holy Spirit who dwells within us. We've been communing with him. We've been in the word. We've been in prayer. We've been praying in tongues. We're, 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 being, uh, we're, we're just filled with God. And we come together and we realize that the moment that we're together, that there is something that we have to offer because we're not coming to be a spectator. We're coming to be a participator. We're not coming to get or take, but we're coming to give. Not to be blessed, but to be a blessing. It's a paradigm shift, a change of thinking and mentality. But it is the church of the New Testament. You can leave here and go to many, 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 many other places. You can think I'm crazy. (laughs) Right, Larry? We've been called one. Prophets have have a life. The number one thing a prophet deals with is rejection. I have overcome. I don't care anymore. I mean, I care. I don't care if you. Oh, I. You know, people talk all the time. I'm just going to throw this out there. People talk all the time about mentorship. I'm not really big on it. I can tell you. Because I have seen that the majority of all the great people that we speak about in the Bible, very few of them had any mentor except God Almighty and Holy Spirit. They did not have another man mentoring their life. The few that did, Timothy, Apostle Paul, as a budding apostle, to do what? To take his place. Elisha had Elijah as the budding prophet to become the prophet over Israel to take Elijah's place. 
that I see is the perfect mentoring requirement and responsibility to have. But each and every one of us have a place. Now, I believe in discipleship wholeheartedly. That's different. You all should be disciples. It's good to have people in your life that are influencers to make you a better disciple. You can learn from. But that has been abused, I believe, in the church, that word mentorship. <clears throat> and so then when we come together, this place not only becomes a place of equipping as the fivefold office is doing their part, but it becomes a place of revival where fire begets fire, where fire adds to fire, where we get encouraged and the gifts that God has placed in us, we begin to see manifest and we get encouraged so that when we're in the world, we begin to realize, hey, Holy Spirit, you gave me that encouragement for this person. You gave me those words when I laid hands on this person. Father, I saw you move and there was a miracle that took place in this person when I did this and I obeyed you, how much more, God, do you want to do the same thing for these people who are like me, who are suffering and in pain and separated from you, God? Because I tell you, there is no revival if we don't have a heart for the lost. You are not revived. Don't fool yourself. I'm not going to fool myself. Because when we have a real revived heart, I'm telling you, our heart is going to break with the things that break the heart of God, and we won't be able to contain it. We'll be hurting for them. We'll be compelled, Paul said. I'm compelled. I can't stop. I have to do it. Let me read this to you out of the Passion, Ephesians 2.10. He says, we have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. I want you to do something with me. Maybe some of you won't do it. I want you to take your hand, whatever hand you use, take it like this, right next to your face. <laughs> now, do you remember when the prophet told the king to smack them arrows on the ground? He didn't smack them enough. I'm only going to ask you to do this once. But I want you to think about it. You know what I'm going to say. I don't want you to go like this. I want it to be a slap heard around the world. We must awaken before we can arise. We must understand our image and our identity before we can fulfill. In the spirit, I want you to slap your face. I'm going to count to three. To wake yourself up. Come on, it's a prophetic gesture. You want God to do it. Ready? One, two, three. Oh, you guys were weak. I think we, I think we got to do it again. You're not awake. Let's do it again. Left hand, other hand. One, two, three. All right, that was better. I felt that better, at least for me. I lied. I got to obey the Spirit of God. I wanted to do it once. <laughs> yes, we should have them. Hallelujah. So let's look at this Ephesians chapter 4. I want to finish here. <clears throat> Can I ask you a question? How often do you eat? <laughs> Too often? Probably true for many of us. Do you eat three times a day? Maybe three times a day and a snack at nine? Fourth meal at Taco Bell? (laughs) 
Uh, fourth meal. Good advertising. Right? Is that good advertising or what? Almost, almost Mike Lindell level. <laughs> Just kidding. If it's Trump, believe me. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, we eat all the time because we got to keep this thing moving, this body of ours. How much are we eating in the presence of God? How much are we partaking of spiritual things? What if I said to you, Joy said this to me, she said, why don't you tell them that this week you're fasting, you get Sunday morning meal and Wednesday night. But some of y'all aren't getting Wednesday night. And you know who you are. You're only getting Sunday morning meal this week. I'm not saying you got it. You know, I'm not going to say, I, you know, I'm commanding you to be at every service. But gosh, if that's all you've got, you don't have much of anything. Because this is not the place that you come to be fed. I'm going to hit that in the spirit. That is a lie from the devil. All my Christian life, my 25 years of pastoring, I heard people say, well, I'm leaving this church because I don't get fed here. You're not supposed to be fed here. I have been to a place in the spirit with God. I am talking to you from that place. I am telling you that you can come to this place if you want to, but you have to go on your own and find this pasture where I have been, and you will find the same things that I have and maybe better things that you can show me. That's what happens when we gather together and a fivefold office minister speaks. He is leading you to pasture where he has or she has been so that you may go follow and find it when? In the secret place, in your time with God, when you read the word, when you pray, when you commune with God all day. And I'll share what my, I do is a seven o'clock Zoom meeting on Thursdays on Facebook. Well, you connect it on Facebook if I remember. I normally don't. But, uh, <laughs> but if you want to be on, let me know. Um, and, and we just do a Zoom meeting, and, and I share a little bit, but I, I, we were talking about Smith Wigglesworth and the secret of his power. He said, I don't often pray for a half an hour, but I never let a half an hour go by without praying. What is he saying? I have constant fellowship with the Father in Jesus through Holy Spirit, and I continue to walk with him. How do you think he raised people from the dead? People said they saw him. He was a plumber by trade in his earlier years. And people would be convicted in their house because the light, this is what they said, the light of God shone from his face because he was communing with Holy Spirit. And that's just any man. That can be me. That can be you. Let us be those who are known by our communion with the Father, our fellowship. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, verse 11. Oh. I'll get there. And he himself gave some the apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the equipping of the saints. I'll stop right. That's what I believe is the only function of the fivefold office is to equip the saints. They can be the ministers, priests, and kings that God has destined them to be and fulfill the call of God upon their life, to their family, to their neighborhood, to their job and school, to wherever they network, their sphere of influence. The fivefold office can't be in your sphere of influence, but Holy Spirit is in your sphere of influence. Because he resides within you. And the glory of God is in you. The glory of God, the kingdom of heaven, is in you. And we must come to an understanding of the office of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. We've been flirting with the apostles and prophets for probably the last 30 years or so. But they're only now, I believe, coming into full, fuller fruition. Listen, 
Jesus is held, Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, in the heavens until the restoration of all things. We are in a time of reformation. See, I believe prophets speak to what I call four R's. They speak to re repentance, revival, revelation, and reformation. And I believe that is the call of God in this hour is for reformation. Without reformation, there cannot be restoration. When the church is reformed, it can then embrace the new that God wants to do. What it is is a new wineskin Jesus talked about. And the greater the wine that is to be outpoured, the greater the reformation. I am telling you and prophesying to you today that God is getting ready to shake the church in a way that we have never seen it shaken. And it's a good thing because those that survive the shaking are going to be in the glory of God. They'll have become the new wineskin that he might pour out the end day wine. And it's going to be phenomenal. Yes, amen, amen. Let's give him praise. Thank you, Lord, God. I want to be part of your last day's move, oh God. Yes, Father, we give you praise, Lord. We lift you up. You're worthy, oh God. Hallelujah. Lord, let us be those, God, that you desire to pour through, Father. May we live our lives right before you, God, that we can be those vessels. Open our eyes, Lord, our spiritual eyes that we might see. Father, I, 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 you might want to do this. I just lay hands on my eyes right now, God. I lay hands on my ears right now, God. Even on my mouth and on my tongue that I might taste and see your goodness, oh God. In the land of the living, Father, I thank you. Do it, Lord, in this hour. Father, in Jesus' name. You know, we can liken the um, <clears throat> apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher to five. <clears throat> and this is true. And this is, this is why the church is a problem. Um, am I going to? Okay. Everybody good? So the reason it's a problem is because we haven't understood the fivefold office. And when we try to run the church by one office, like pastor, you can't do it. It is not designed to function that way. I believe when Jesus left the earth and he said that I will come back to you, what he meant was, I'm coming back to you in the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Let alone for every one of us, he comes to us via the agency of Holy Spirit. Amen? Right? And so, but he also came as that, this is the expression of him. And so, a pastor is not the full expression, nor a teacher, evangelist, prophet, or apostle. And you can liken it to, to help you get understanding, when you look at your hand, the apostle is like the thumb. Because he touches all the other offices. He can be all the other offices. I know some apostles will prophesy your, your boots off, man. Because they can, when they flow in the office of the prophet, they're better than me. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm amazed. I know, I know real apostles in this hour. And I know false apostles in this hour. And I know real prophets in this hour. And I know some that I'm thinking might be false. Those that hung on to those Trump prophecies and would not let them go. Beware. Something's wrong. You would give a prophetic word and you can't repent that you missed it. There's something wrong. So know them by their fruits. That's all I'm saying. Prophets like your middle finger points the way. Evangelist, or your, finger, your pointy finger, sorry. The evangelist is the middle finger. He's the longest, you know, because he's reaching out for the lost, out showing us how to get there to do the same. The pastor's like the ring finger. You know, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor. Because the ring finger shows that he's married to the church. And they say that this finger, this blood vessel from this finger goes right to your heart. Connected to the heart of God. The one that has that. 
you want me to pastor you? You might not be happy what I have to say. But I love you. I have that same connection. And the teacher, he's like the line upon line. Right? <clears throat> Hopefully that helps. Evangelist pastors, I mean evangelist prophets, uh, apostles, prophets, teachers, for the equipping of the saints, so the saints can do the work of ministering and edifying the body of Christ till we all, the whole body, comes to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is how I know that the apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor, and teacher have never passed away and will never pass away because the church hasn't come to the fullness of Christ in perfection and maturity. So they have to stay here until that happens. And he goes on to say then, and... Uh, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together. How? By what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying or energizing of itself in love. You see, each of us connected to Christ, who is the head, growing up into him by the equipping of the fivefold office, do the work of ministering one to, uh, to another, edify the body of Christ, cause a connection, joints, right? You know, marrow, ligaments, muscle, tendons, skin, all connecting, and joined and knit together. How? By when everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing, in what they've been called to do brings about an effective working as they release what they have and it causes a growth of the body for edifying of itself in love. See that? And so it begins, I mean, it can't happen. It, he says, from whom the whole body are you part of the whole? Well, he says every part, every joint, that's every single one of us. You are significant in the kingdom of God. What God has destined to do in the church from the beginning of time, he cannot do if we all don't do our part. Yeah, you know, Steve and Jennifer, I just felt when you guys came in, I just <clears throat> had this word, generation, generation, that God has, uh, he's done an awesome thing in your life, in children, in great-grandchildren, or, or, or grandchildren, or maybe great-grand too, <laughs> before it's all done, and maybe I'm prophesying, I'm not sure. Uh, but, uh, but I just believe that he is so pleased in that. Uh, I just feel that sense of him because, you know, God is all about generations. He always speaks to generations. What I'm speaking now is maybe for generations even to come. I would love for everything that I'm saying right now to be fulfilled in my lifetime. But there are others who've gone before who did not have that happen. Nevertheless, we all must be prepared. And that's what you have been doing is preparing not just yourselves, and your kids, but now your grandkids, and it's spreading, and that influence God wants you to continue to have for in this hour, the very thing that was prophesied in the book of Malachi is coming to pass, and God is saying that he's turning the hearts of the fathers and mothers, and the grandfathers and grandmothers to the children, and not just even in a natural standpoint, but even more so 
in a spiritual fulfillment. And I sense that, that it's upon you, God, that in that what you've done in the natural, God is getting ready to do even a greater measure in your lives, spiritual, that the influence that you have will increase into sons and daughters that are not of your natural lineage. And, well, you even have that somewhat in those that have come in to join your family, sons and daughters, but even so more so that, that God is wanting to have that influence uh, expand in your life for you to, uh, to, to part of that fulfillment of the passage. And I, I believe it's sequential that when, when you embrace what God wants to do in your life, you, you'll see some draw to you, and you're going to know that that's God bringing them closer to you, and that's one that you're supposed to begin to, to mentor and work with. And then, you're, and, 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 and then as you do that, it's a sequential part of it. It says that children are to turn to mothers and fathers. And they begin to embrace, realizing there's a whole generation who barely knows God, who has not seen the manifestation of God on the earth for the last 30, 40 years. But now is the time that they're going to begin to see it. And it doesn't matter if it, where you do it at. It happens in your home. Pray for them, and a manifestation of healing comes. They get set free through deliverance. Whatever happens, it doesn't matter who sees it. God knows. But it's going to be an, a, a, such an impact in their life to change them for eternity. And while they live on the earth, and they're, they're impacted in the world. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise, Father. We love you with all our hearts, God. Thank you, Lord. May we burn greater and hotter for you, we pray today. Thank you, Jesus. You know, the last thing that Jesus did after that triumphal entry was that he, uh, he found that fig tree. Now, the Bible says that he saw the fig tree, and the fig tree didn't have figs on it, and he cursed it. And uh, that, they, that immediately, from the moment that he cursed it, it withered. You know, he said, henceforth, ne you'll never bear fruit again. And I, that used to bother me. The poor fig tree. What in the world? You know, Jesus, what's, what's up with this? You know? And, uh, you know, and then in Mark it says it wasn't the time of figs. I'm like, it wasn't even the time of figs. What's going on? You're killing the poor tree. And it wasn't even the time of figs. And finally in prayer, the Lord said to me that it is not acceptable to not bear fruit in the moment that the master requires. And I realized this was the last thing that he did. Because when Jesus comes, he says, well, I find faith on the earth. That faith is really tied to a persistent woman nagging the king, right? You know, it's us persistent prayer. What is tied to faith is prayer. You have greater faith the more you pray. The more you're standing for someone, you're not going to speak negative about people you pray for because you're standing in faith for God to change them, you know? And it's just like anything else. You're praying for the United States. You're not going to sit there and just slam it all day long because you're believing God's going to do something, you know? And, 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 and I, I don't believe that, that politics is the answer. I believe the church is the only answer. The only answer. And if we don't shine, bye-bye America. You know, one thing Mario Murillo said is, <clears throat> I'll share this with you, as he said, uh, Christianity will survive without America. America will not survive without Christianity. And I really believe that is so true. You know, we've got a lot of people out there preaching about men making covenants with God about America. You can't make a covenant with God. God makes covenant with man. You can't say that. You know, that's not, that's not scriptural. You know, God has, n I'm going to tell you right now, I'm just going to say it. God has no, res no uh, commitment to America to save it aside from the church doing what they're destined to do. He's not going to save America just for the sake of saving America. America is not God's country. Jesus didn't die for America. Jesus died for the world. The world is what God is after. And he will make it happen however it needs to happen. And we don't know what's in the plan of God. We don't know what he destined. I don't believe good things for America, but I'm not going to go there and talk to you about that. But I will tell you, you better be prepared and ready. 
and bearing fruit because he's coming. Why don't you stand with me? He is coming to inspect the fruit. And we need to be those who are bearing fruit in this hour. He is pouring out and he's pouring out right now. I want you just to close your eyes and just begin to believe God for an outpouring of his spirit on your life right now. Father, oh, just begin to pray in the spirit if you'd like to. Father, we just worship you, God. We just, we just believe you, Father. God, that you're changing us. You're changing your church, God. Whether we're visitors here or members here, God, we thank you, Lord, God, that wherever we are, Father, that you would cause us to be a catalyst for change. But we can't do it, Lord, if we don't embrace that which you're calling us to do. Father, may, I, may we see like we've never seen before. May the truth of the fact, God, that you are pouring out revelation upon your remnant people, may it be true of my life, God, that you would pour out, Father, even now new revelation to me that I would see like I've never seen before. I believe, God, that you want to show me things that you've never shown me before, God. Father, that I might understand more of who I really am. Who is, what is my identity? That I might understand in a greater measure who I've become because you've come to reside within me. And that I may uh, uh, prophetically understand the call, the destiny of my life, that I would fulfill it in all its aspects, oh God. Keep praying, church. Oh, Father, we need you. We need you, Spirit of God. May you pour out afresh as you are doing in this hour. May there be a new Azusa Street, a new charismatic renewal. May there be a reverberation of the sound. Oh God, of Pentecost, even in this house right now, Father God, pour out, oh God, your spirit once again as you shook the place in Acts chapter 4, Father, and they were all filled again with the Holy Spirit. May you now pour out upon us as a consuming fire and, and burn away that which is not of you, that only that which is of the kingdom of God may remain. Father, may your spirit pour out upon us afresh May we be filled with the Spirit, speaking in other tongues, manifesting the gifts of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, have your way in our lives, we say. Oh, Father. Change us, oh God, is our prayer. May we be more like you, Jesus. Jesus, make us to be more like you, we pray. May none of us leave this place. God, I don't want to leave this place the same as I came. I want to be changed, oh God. May your word do its perfect work in us, Lord. Oh God, may it convict, oh Father. May it change, God. May it bring repentance and change of thinking, Lord. Oh God, may we be able to embrace May we be able to allow our minds to be blown away, God. Father, to embrace just the magnificence, the, the great magnitude of all that you desire to flow through us. Yes, even me, O oh God. Say that. Yes, even me, O oh God. Even me, O oh God. Hallelujah. Pray this with me. Say, Father, I hear your voice. A stranger's voice I do not follow. I receive today the call upon my life to be a prophetic minister, to know things, God, that you even want to do in my life before they come to pass. Come on, pray this with me. Father, change me. I receive the identity and the call today. Father, I lift you up. I exalt you. I magnify your name. Do in me, O oh God, your will, not my will, but your will be done. Come on, let's cry out to him. Father, do it. Not my will, but your will be done. On earth, Lord, as it is in heaven, as you have declared forth, Father God, Oh, God, from the annals of time, you have declared forth our destinies and our purpose for existing. 
Father, may it come forth now in this hour, O oh God, as it is in heaven. May it so be on earth as we surrender our will to you, O oh God. May our will be changed to your will, O oh Father. We surrender, God, in all sincerity and truth. Have your way, Lord, that we will fulfill it, God. Oh, Father, that we will fulfill it, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.